Every single living thing on Earth wants to make more of itself. It is, at least from an evolutionary perspective, the very purpose of our existence. And it has to be said, us Homo sapiens are doing a pretty good job. There's 7.8 billion of us by the latest estimation. And by 2050, we'll round that up to a solid 10 billion. And whilst we might be winning the Darwinian game of life, is it really cause for celebration? The world is already struggling to cope with the impacts of our burgeoning species. And with the added pressure of another 2 billion people, we're led to the age-old question, are there too many people on the planet? Earth is a pretty busy place right now, but it hasn't always been this way. From the time that uh, humankind became humankind about 300,000 years ago, the world's population has increased extremely slowly until the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, when suddenly population absolutely skyrocketed. The cause of this precipitous rise, the Industrial Revolution, a period of huge technological development. Increase in population came from very basic improvements, sanitation, for example, and people moving to cities, and increased solidarity and social cohesion actually led to, you know, more children surviving. But as we rolled into the 60s, alarm bells began to sound. Newspaper articles and books were published, warning that if our numbers continued to rise, disaster and famine would soon follow. While these dystopian writings weren't new, they caught the public's attention like never before. In high school, I read this book, The Population Bomb, which begins with this sort of memorable sentence saying something about the race to feed humanity is over and that hundreds of billions of people are going to starve to death in the next decade. Not only were many of these doomsday predictions misguided, because we now know that they failed to come true, they were overtly classist and racist in their attitudes, often placing the blame directly on countries with larger populations in the global south. It was a smokescreen and a, a very easy and quick and lazy way to look at the changes that were happening and to not question the real drivers of environmental degradation. So yes, there are a lot of people on the planet right now, but population growth is actually falling, not climbing. On the whole, we're having fewer children and women are gaining more autonomy and decision-making power. If population growth is declining, then what's really the problem here? Enter overconsumption. It's really important to acknowledge that climate change isn't caused just simply by population sizes. We don't all consume equally. Today's capitalist society is built on the principle of exponential growth. Wherever you look, you're encouraged to buy, upgrade and consume. And this consumption is hugely unequal across the world. If we looked at who's really uh, consuming what, then we will see that actually the vast majority of the world's population, especially in countries like India and in the large parts of Africa, are not the over-consumers here. One way to understand the inequality of consumption is to look at each country's overshoot day. This is the point in the year where demand for resources by a country's average citizen exceeds the resources that Earth can regenerate in that year. For example, you can see that if everyone lived like the average American citizen, then the Earth's resources would run out by early March. But compare that to the average consumption of someone in, say, Ecuador or Jamaica, and we'd hit Earth overshoot day seven months later. There is some extremely unwise consumption, and then there's a whole raft of secondary effects of consumption that we haven't thought of. The richest 10% of the world's population actually emit more than 50% of global emissions. So that's a massive disparity. These inequalities are present in every part of our lives, including in the emissions that are driving us to climate breakdown. Add to this the fact that some of the emissions that do come from the global south have actually been outsourced to them by the global north. In other words, companies in rich nations relocate their carbon emitting activities to poorer nations, twisting the emission figures against them. So in the last 50 years or so, the trend has accelerated to outsourcing dirtier, more polluting industries to the global south. We literally ship our uh, waste, whether it's coal or textiles or leather or plastics, 
we are asking other countries to do the dirty work of manufacturing. And the greatest injustice of it all, these countries, which have done the least to get us into this mess, are being hit the hardest. So there's a real issue to ask about why are we rich and why are there vulnerable people and vulnerable countries in the world right now? They're not vulnerable, you know, from the start. There's a systemic way in which their vulnerability has been created over time. This is why it is so important that as we try and find our way out of this mess, the majority of the work is done by those who have enjoyed the majority of the benefits. High income nations must not only undergo change at home, they must also support poorer nations as they attempt to do their bit in addressing climate breakdown. And to do this, we need to look at climate reparations. But what does this mean and how does it work? The word reparations comes from repair, to, to heal and repair the harm. And I don't think we can build a just world without looking at where the existing inequalities came from. The world has enough resources to support everyone if we use them wisely. First, in the global north, we have a responsibility to repair the systems of oppression that have left those least responsible most affected. That's it. We're on this planet. We're not going to jump off. So we have to you know, clean up our act. When we think about how to tackle the climate crisis, instead of focusing on how many of us live on the planet, we need to start focusing on how we live on the planet. And so it's really a matter of political will as to whether we can service and support you know, the needs of 10 billion people. It sounds like a huge number, but it really isn't. Uh, it's very possible. It isn't a good party if only 1% of the guests are having a good time. So as we get ready to open the door to another 2 billion hopeful humans, let us work together to create a fairer society so that all of us have a chance to flourish. The breakdown was made possible by Waterbear the first impact-driven streaming platform where you can watch hundreds of documentaries about the future of our planet and directly take action. It's completely free, so why not check it out?